You are listening to the People Centric Podcast, where we talk through the toughest challenges that people face at work and give practical advice to fixing those challenges. Thanks for joining our movement to create workplaces that are happier, healthier, aligned, and empowered by putting people at the center of all that we do. Hey, people-centric leaders, we are so excited to join you today because we're going to talk about you today in the jobs that you have. Something that we've seen recently is some statistics that are pretty interesting that state that 75% of the workforce is currently looking around for a new job. 75%, which means that on this call, and there's going to be four of us on this today, which means three out of the four of us are currently looking for a new job. And since I own the company, this is just an intervention moment <laughs> for you guys. Why are you guys all looking for new jobs? What's <laughs> happening, Philip? You just joined it. No, I'm just kidding. I just came, so I'm not in that 75%. You're not in that yeah, 75%. the fresh phase, right? Yeah. yeah Thanks for not saying yet. Yeah. I appreciated the not saying <laughs> yet part, right, as we added that. When you look to change, maybe that's when the rest of us, you know, we there, buy people some trick. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> that's it. Yeah. Well, we'll do, that's the offers on the table. I got a number. I don't know what the number is, but if you guys want to meet later, put that together. That'd be great. That'd save you a lot of hassle, actually. It'd be fantastic. But I think as people are looking around for jobs, two things is one is I don't think that I think that is a change that's reflective more of technology and communication and the information age than it is really about how people feel about their job. We know that engagement levels really haven't changed dramatically over quite a bit of time. Like people still feel the same way they do about their job. What is different is how you can go look for a job has shifted. So you can easily, more easily look at the other side and find out maybe what it's like or what other jobs are out there. But as people fantasize, and as you're thinking about what types of jobs you might look for, some of you might be working for a big company thinking, I wanna go work for a small company because that sounds a lot more fun, a lot more cozy. Some of you who work for a small company might be saying, I wanna go work for a big company because I wanna be in this nice warm corporate cocoon where everything is professionalized and all of the things are really, really good. All those everything. So the size of the organization seems to have a big impact on where people feel like they should go. It would be nice if we were bigger. It would be nice if we were smaller. Or if you own a company and you're inside of a company and you may not be looking around, you might have a vision for your own company. We talk to a lot of small business owners who have teams of 10 people or less who are like, I don't want to grow past 20. I don't ever see us getting past 15 employees or I don't want to see us getting really big. Or we've seen some big teams who have become big or like, how did we get here? Oh my gosh, it's totally different. What's different about running the organization? So today's topic we want to talk about is scale. We want to talk about like what's different inside of the organization, whether it's a small company or a medium-sized company or a big company. Where, where do the people-centric principles fit? What happens differently inside those organizations? Because if you're an employee thinking, boy, it would be nice to jump over to that side then you, I, we want to be realistic about what that might look like. If you're an employee inside of a big company, frustrated with a big company, we want to be clear about what's natural about big companies maybe versus small companies. Or if you're an owner or director of a company that's thinking about growing or that you have been scaling and you're struggling with some of those, this you might get some helpful tidbits as well as things to think about as you scale your company. So those are all the different things that we're gonna be talking about. This is gonna be an exciting topic. We're gonna to geek out on this idea of the size of the organization. And with us today, we've got some four members from our team. We've got Philip right here sitting next to me. Hello, people-centric people. I didn't even ask you a question. I just wanted to let you see if you're building, a, building that size. You've gotten to work for different sizes of organization. What's the largest organization you've worked for? I worked for a large insurance company, which was a Fortune 50. Um, and that was a pretty epic experience. And at one point, you know, they flew us to the headquarters in Boston. So I got to meet our CEO with 500 other people they were trying to convince to stay there forever, um, which was a really cool experience. And that led me to realize I want to go small. So it literally from small mom and pop stores to nonprofits to here with the people centric crew. OK, so you've seen all the different sizes there. So you've gotten to play in, in lots of stops in between and all of that. Yep, different. Yeah. Also some stops at the university level, too. Yeah. Yeah. So you've gotten to see lots of different types of organizations. Uh, that's really great. We've got Diana Royalty on our team like joining us live from the West Coast. Diana, you've gotten to work for different size teams as well. Yeah. Yeah. I, I worked. In college, I worked for the limited brands, which is like Victoria's Secret and Limited and White Barn Candle Company. It's like this huge conglomerate of just like retail stores. And I really worked there for the discount because it was awesome. 
I like how you, the way you dropped that sounded like you're like, I've worked for the limited, ever heard of it? Like, <laughs> well, limited brand, like lots of people don't realize that all of those things are under the limited umbrella. Like it's a lot of stores under there. Kind of ironic if you think about it. Like the limited brand should be limited, but it's not limited. Not limited. It's unlimited. Yeah. Yeah. It's unlimited is what they should call that. The corporation should be called unlimited. There you go. Free advice for limited. There you go. Yeah. But then after that, I went and did like a 30 person architecture firm. So I kind of, I've been been around, I've been around, done lots of stuff. And then to a small startup consulting firm. Yes. Where there was, I think four or five of us when I first joined, like it was four, four of us really. Quite small, quite at the way, 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 way at the beginning, early, early, early phases, Diane has been with us. So it's a, it's key when we didn't have things like a phone or file cabinets or a plan or a plan, (laughs) (laughs) you know, all the things Thought we would do this. So you've seen the big, you've seen the big corporate super processed, big hierarchy thing, the middle size company and the smaller size company. So we've seen all of those different things. Yeah, yeah. And then we've also got Matt Griswold here from our team. And Matt also, Matt made a, maybe the biggest one step jump of anybody on our team, went from a pretty decent sized company to our size company. Is that right? Pretty decent sized company. Uh, JP Morgan, ever heard of it? Uh, yeah, one of those, one of those. One of those organizations. In fact, I was—I remember going through the interview process for People Centric after somebody had said that this place existed. I didn't—I had never heard of People Centric, and we were in the same town. Uh, and I was had never heard of it. Uh, just different, you know, worlds there. Uh, but I remember at the time you all going, "Okay, so do you do you want the job or do you not want that? We would like to hire you." But I had a lot to think about. There's a lot to think about uh, going from a large organization like that to uh, a small business. Um, I did have to clarify earlier as we were talking about this that I'm, you know, I'm glad I made the jump. I feel like I'm well-placed and, uh, you know, I love you. You love me uh, most of the time. And so, yeah, I get it. Uh, I get it. So I, th- I feel like, I feel like I'm good, but yeah, I've seen the big and the small, all of a sudden I come to people centric and I'm building desks. You know what I mean? I never, ever once did that uh, working at the large bank. I, I was laughing, Matt, because we uh, we recently did some presentations together at a conference where we were showing pictures of that. And they were fond memories, I think, from our standpoint. But I had somebody that in the session, I don't think I've even told you this, like after the session came up and said, like, well, you're promoting your team, but you really you're making like Matt, who's a presenter consultant. He's sitting on the floor with the screwdriver, like putting a desk together. And that was like the the show. And they're like, well, we had a good time with that. It was fun. <laughs> I also enjoy doing that. I, I enjoy doing it. Full disclaimer, I enjoy doing stuff like that anyway. But it was nice, you know, working with a, a large bank. If my trash bin was full, I did not empty it. I called somebody and be like, ah, my trash is a little full. If I can send somebody <laughs> on down here because uh, I plan on putting more trash in. Uh, so I'm just I'm saving you guys the headache later. Uh, and <laughs> You know, that's not how the way, you know, not the way we work, especially since they had a move to Seattle, right? Well, but I feel like this is where some of your prima donna stuff came from. You know what I mean? It's that corporate that's culture. That's probably true. That's <laughs> true. People are thinking more like, like nobody does that here either. That's just Matt. <laughs> that was just Matt was the only one that did that. <laughs> we just kept taking it out for him because he just kept calling yeah. me. I don't know. I'll take your trash out. Fine, I guess. <laughs> right, guys. Thanks. Appreciate it. And then, and then I, I, somebody told me recently on the podcast, whoever the host is sometimes doesn't introduce themselves. So I'm Don Harkey too, from people centric. So I should say that if you're watching us on YouTube, you can see that I know, but some of you in podcasts are going like, I can't see you. I don't see you, but you can, if you watch us on YouTube, by the way. So we are we're live on YouTube, not live on YouTube, not live on YouTube. You can watch us, but you can see us, our pictures. It's different than being live. But yeah, when I, I also came from big companies, I worked for two fortune 100 companies, not 50. Thanks Liberty Mutual. Dropping that yeah, one. Well, yeah. The Emu. Gotcha. Yeah. Oh man, the, now the song's in my head too. It's about when I left. It was too much. I couldn't, I couldn't bear it. The emu was too much. Yeah, they, people would just say, oh, the emu guy. So you're like, I'm gonna emu, emu out of emu. here is what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah, I get it. <laughs> Doug. <laughs> I I tried out for the Doug role. They said no. <laughs> oh, and you're like, that's it. I'm leaving. I'm done. I'm done. 
I worked for 3M and Archer Daniels Midland before, and I liked Matt's story about the trash can things. I can remember my first day at 3M, you'd go to a two day, like uh, history of 3M class where they like bombard you with like 3M products and stuff. So you can see like, look at this, all this stuff. We make scotch guard and scotch tape and post-it notes and all these really cool things. And you come out of there like, my gosh, this is amazing. And you go to your desk on the first day and your computer's sitting there and they have a number and it says, it's just a, on a post-it note, which makes sense. And they said, call this number when you get to this desk. And it doesn't explain anything. It just says, call this number when you've arrived. Don, welcome, I'll call this number. So I called my kids, hey, Don, I'm supposed to call this number. Like, oh, we'll send somebody right down for you. And I'm like, you're sending somebody down. Who's coming down? What's happening? And it was the ergonomics team from 3M showed up <laughs> and they made sure they set up my chair and my keyboard and my monitor and my desk and all the stuff so that I had minimal stresses and strains while I was working. That's, that's neat. You know what we did? We said, here's a desk, but you have to build it yourself. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit of a different approach but there's anyway. some ergonomics involved in that too probably make sure you lift with your back or not, not your back lift with your yeah. legs um, <laughs> measure twice <laughs> cut once uh yeah. well, i'm just trying to get you all set off you know on the right foot do you have a larger phillips head screwdriver no this is the only one we have we have to use little allen wrench and overcome yeah that's all we had to build it. So it's a tiny Allen wrench that gets you every time, you know, that's a, that's a stressor on the wrist every time. I don't. And then I'm like, that's a tool. So I'm going to save it. And so I have a drawer at home. That's just got like 50 of those little tiny Allen wrenches that are all the same size that you can all put together, you know, cause hashtag small business. We need to save all those things <laughs> that we're putting together. So I thought maybe what we could do is we could start and we could think about different organizational sizes and kind of talk about like, what are the strengths and weaknesses of those sizes? Because I think that the size, is there a right size for an organization? And the answer is probably no. Like we can think of pros and cons for big organizations or small organizations, but let's start with the really small ones. Like let's think about like 10 people or less. What are some of the strengths or weaknesses or characteristics of an organization of that size? I know you can get stuff done a lot more quickly. You have to have less conversations to be able to get things done. I have less layers to go through to be able to have a conversation with a person that might impact the thing being done. Uh, you might have direct access to the person in charge, the leader of the company. Uh, you might not have been in the meeting, but you heard all about the meeting and what came out of it because it was a small enough organization to where you just all went out to lunch anyway. We had a closed door meeting, but then we all went to lunch and talked about the meeting after it was over anyway, <laughs> right? Uh, you probably knew everybody on a first name basis. Uh, you know everybody's not only the name, but you know the strengths and the weaknesses of everybody on on, on you know on, on a on a first level basis there too, because you're working with them kind of on a day in and day out um, scale. So I don't want to sabotage. I could keep going, but somebody else have one. Well, no, I I like the I like the less red tape. Right, you can move things really quickly which I will say is both a good thing and a bad thing. Because sometimes you like get this thing all the way to execution and then it's like, oh, we don't want to do that anymore. Never mind. Like there's so many ideas and so many things that we can execute on because we're high functioning and we all know each other's strengths and we can get stuff done quickly. But sometimes we do things and then we never use them. Yeah. So I think that, you yeah, know. That's, actually, that's, a, that's, a good, that's a good point too. You know, I, I, I think most people would choose that though over the path of, 16 red tapes in three months. And, you know, Don, you, we see that in the sales process quite a bit. Whenever organizations want to work with us, the larger the organization, we know this lead time is going to be quite a bit longer because there's several meetings and many people that need to be involved in that decision where if it's a small business, it might be a phone call. Like, that sounds great. Sold. Let's do it. Um, you know, so there's there's benefits uh, in that too. It might it might sound like uh, Don, and this might be, sound silly, but if you're talking about office culture, I remember when you got that uh, not a humidifier, but the air infuser, maybe like a Scentsy thing or whatever, and it got shipped to the office, and he just wheels his chair around like, "What are we feeling? Lemongrass or what do you want?" Like, yeah, the whole office had an input in that. Um, uh, I remember when Bethany the Keurig was no longer acceptable we need an espresso machine right that was fairly fairly short order ago you can't do that in large organizations it's a much bigger conversation but for that type of stuff super easy it's yeah fun. there have been many times where i'm like i just want this thing and don's like yeah go get the thing like whatever you want it doesn't matter but no i've never said i wanted a maserati or anything but you know if i want <laughs> something for my desk or i think something would be cool for the office we usually just get it we usually just yeah. go do 
a dual monitor here. I remember because one of them, the one I was using went out. I remember calling like Diana and I'm like, hey, it was really helpful. And, you know, maybe coming from a larger organization, you had to like build your case. Like it was super helpful when I was able to do that. It was much more efficient with my work. I didn't have to turn so much or tap. I'm like, yeah, just go get it. Just go get it. Whatever you, you know, just send me the receipt. Just go get it. Like stuff like that. Super easy. Yeah. yeah, I'm not a huge Star Wars fan, but I just the difference in my mind, it's like the size of the Death Star, as opposed to, you know, when they have the little like dog fights in space and that's like a smaller, you know, but then something goes wrong and they're like, quick robot, fix the thing, you know, and like, oh my gosh, they use duct tape on the Star. I feel like that's the difference between this huge organization. It just takes so much time to turn. And maybe a Death Star is a bad idea. Maybe we'll call it a Life Star, something that does good in the world, the product star. <laughs> The business star, you know, or a ship. The bigger the ship, the longer it takes to turn. Um, and smaller boats, they just get zip around. So what I, irony in all this, when I was at Liberty, it was similar to Matt's, you know, all-star JP Morgan experience where you're like, I do not clean the trash. But we were an office of 10 people, um, removed most of the Liberty Mutual Centers are just massive. And ours was not. So we were kind of an odd duck because we had a team of 10 salespeople who are on the same team, but then not um, with our manager and, you know, once in a while directors and leadership people would come in. And so it was still kind of very much boots on the ground, but there wasn't really any of that localized control. So it was the cliche office situation where corporate comes in. They're like, what? You're, you're doing all these things? We're like, yeah, we just, we're just doing these different things. Um, always in a compliance and accordance, right? But all the other things we just kind of did in our own way. Um, and so I think that balance tension, tension too, where it seems like that old structure, you're constantly reevaluating. This is the line we have to, this is how things are done versus, you know, when you're a small team, you just do organically what you choose to do, which is really fun. Like painting the wall behind us or putting tables together or getting espresso machines. Yeah. I like the point and all of the things that you just pointed out were real and have happened recently. So just for saying all that, the wall behind us literally was painted by fill up recently so just to lay that out but I, I like that point of saying there are small teams in big teams too right so there's sometimes there's a bit of a feel for a small company because you have a small team within a bigger one that, that can exist what's the downside of the smaller team I mean Diana talked a little bit about the the you could run the wrong direction with things but go ahead Diana I, I struggle with the lack of um we'll just call it structure just like the general lack of structure I really love a policy and procedure. I love rules. If I worked in like a union environment, I would be all about it because I just, I like the rules. I'll follow the rules. It's good for me. I'm down with it. But I have had to adapt and learn in this environment that they're just, there's less procedure. There's less policy. There's less order. There's less I don't know what to call it. Just you, There's no set way to go do your thing. So you either have to create the structure and figure it out yourself, or you have to like ask other people how they would do it. I mean, there's, it's just, it's very free. It's very loosey goosey. Which sounds wonderful. Thanks for the segue, Diana. I think that's one of those things that's also, also wonderful about that. Uh, you know, the downside of that though, I would add to this, Diana wouldn't say this, but Diana's the COO of People Centric. Diana can't always be the CEO of people centric. Sometimes Diana is busy doing other things that take her away from being, and I say sometimes, like right now, a lot of times, Diana's taken away from, how come I can't just do my job that I was hired to do? Well, because there's not a lot of layers to that, which means there's not a lot of divvying up of responsibilities um, at the same time. So it might be, you know, she might, I don't want to speak for her, but she might be COO from 10 to 12. But you know what, from one to two, she's IT, or she's she's support in some way, uh, you know, that's distracting her, or she might be doing interviews for uh, for a company uh, that that's, that's retained us. And now that task has gotten, um, you know, pushed to Diana, you know, for whatever reason. And so Anyway, so I think that's a part of the challenge too is, uh, you know, I just, and I won't say the name or who it was, but I just got off the phone with somebody who I felt like I was hired to do this. And now, you know what? We have lost positions, but we don't, we're small. We don't immediately just rehire people. We just absorb the duties. And I think that's true with any size of organization and absorbing the duties is one thing. When it's come to the point to where now that's your whole job and you're not, you're no longer doing the thing that you were hired to do. I mean, that leads to frustration and burnout. And ultimately they quit. So, right, Diana? Yeah. I'm, yeah. I think one of the struggles is that we all wear a lot of hats. There is no IT department 
That's just, we just figure it out as we go. There's no one to take out the trash. We got to do that ourselves. Um, you know, if you're like, oh, I need to talk to HR. Well, that's Diana. There's just, there's no department for this. It just, we all wear a lot of hats. So yeah, I think that is a, it's a struggle in a small business for sure. So small teams have hyper have higher levels of communication just because you can do it a lot informally. It's easier to just turn around and say, hey, Philip, we're implementing a new system on Tuesday. Are you game? You know, I need to know anything about that. It's really easy to have those conversations. It just comes up. And a lot of it just happens organically during the course of the day because it's even hard to hide stuff if you're of a small team, especially as you're working together. So a lot of times the communication uh, is, is I'm, I'm trying to be careful not to say that communication is excellent because communication can still absolutely fail in small teams. A lot of times it's avoided conversations, those types of things, but it's a little bit simpler to be able to communicate and get messages out. It's but on the same size, you can call the sorry, go ahead. If you can video call the rest of your team, it's way easier. We can do that on a small team. I can video call anybody on the team at any point. Which, which is your preference after he texts you and sends you an email and calls you and then video calls you. Full access to everybody, which is wonderful. All those things at the same time. That's the way Matt likes to communicate. He's a, he's the, uh, he implemented the real wolf, if you like, office. He actually likes to wolf people. He will do all of this, <laughs> all the forms of communication at the same time just to make sure that he's well heard, which is, which he is, because we're a small team. That works really, really well for us. Uh, you know, but the challenges, as we've talked about, is one is the roles, is you can't define, you can't break up the roles like you normally can. There's more roles that exist inside of a company with less than 10 people than there are people. So people have to play multiple roles. You have to play, wear multiple hats. So uh, you kind of know a little bit of everything that's going on. People have a better feel for this stuff because it's just better within the scope. But the roles, we're kind of all doing a little bit of everything, which sometimes can be frustrating. That doesn't allow people to do what they really do well all the time, which can be frustrating. And then the communication is good. But then sometimes, oftentimes, small teams are also less sophisticated in terms of their processes. So yes, you can make changes really quickly, but maybe the systems aren't as good. Now, that doesn't mean that, by the way, as a small team, you can't build really strong systems. So you can build really strong. And I think we've come a very, 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 very long way in, in the last 10 years or so, thanks to Diana, for our systems and the things that we do. Um, but, you know, it is it is easier to change those. So let's talk about that next elevation of a, of a company. And so like we think about it, you might think, where how, how big are you going to go? Uh, I'm going to pitch. There's a big difference between a 10 person company and even a 25 person company or a 50 person company. And I'll throw those out. And there's a pretty big difference between 25 and 50 that I don't think we have to get that granular. What starts to change when you start to talk about a 25, 50 person company versus like a small, small team? What starts to happen there? I think definitely the communication shifts, right? If I was the COO of a 30 person company, I could not effectively manage all 30 people at once. Like I couldn't stay involved with everything. I couldn't know all of our clients. I couldn't be a part of all of that. There's just not enough time for that, right? Like where I can do that now, I don't think if I was a 50 person company, I would have that luxury. I think it, you have to start breaking things out into departments and pods and, and you know, making things a little bit more siloed. I'm going to use that word. I think. Yeah. Wow. That's what a double-edged sword that is. That's a catch 22, isn't it? Because, you know, we, we have to, uh, I can't tell you how many organizations we've worked with where they're like, man, we grew so fast. We grew so fast. And now we need to take a step back because I don't know that we grew correctly. And you might be listening to going, going, is there, is there a right way to grow and a wrong way? To, I mean, just add more people, right? We're getting bigger and that's better. Not always true. Uh, not always true. And, and whenever we're adding uh, and Diana kind of alluded to it there, but we're not just adding people at that point, we're adding layers uh, at the same time. Uh, now, some of you, and we've worked with organizations like this, where they pride themselves on being flat, very flat. Nobody's the boss of anybody. And that's kind of chaotic. Uh, you think, I understand why you're trying to do that, but but that's uh, kind of chaotic at the same time too. And your people really don't appreciate it, uh, to be honest, uh, honest with you. But, but I think that's one of the things to keep in mind is you're adding people because you have processes that need people to run the processes. But what you're also doing is adding layers. So the meetings that you used to have might not be meetings that you want to continue to have. Uh, the things that you used to be responsible for might not be things that, that uh, you one can be responsible for. Uh, but two, maybe they're not things that you should be responsible for either. Um, there's, a, there's a can and should aspect to that too. 
Yeah. So the communication becomes more difficult just by the nature of the number of people. And I love that you talked about the flat organization structure because there are lots of organizations, especially like the 25, 30 range that they said that are proud to say, but we still operate like we have 10 people. Uh, that's a very different machine, right? If you think about that, you can't have one person that says, well, I'm just going to have everybody report to me and I'll talk to all 29 other people to tell them exactly what's going on. Like, that's just not very practical. That's just, it's very difficult to do that. So you have to start to add some layers or you should start to add some layers, but now you've got the complexity complexity that creates that and you start to get silos that just start to peek in just a little bit. That team over there and this team over there, maybe the they word starts to creep in. Well, they over there, they don't do this and we do this, they don't do this. And you're talking about people on your same team. Where if you have 10 people or eight people or seven people like we have, that doesn't, I don't hear the they word a lot. I don't hear they on the sales team, they don't build that. Like, I don't hear that. Even though we have those different roles played out, we're so close, that doesn't happen. You start getting 25, 50 employees, you start hearing the they word a lot more. What happens to the sophistication of processes for a 25, 50 person company? you have to start building them more, right? Like you have to have something better in place than you did when there was just five of you. The training of that also has to get better, right? If there's going to be some turnover, if there's going to be some stuff, you need standard operating procedures. You need to know how those things are going to be trained. You need to start building some bench strength. So people are thinking through, how do I teach this? How do I make sure it's good? How do I make sure it lasts? If we grow, how do I make sure it works with all the other departments, there's a lot more nuance to all of the policy and procedure. Yeah, yeah. So that the policies have a bigger impact for a 25, 30 person company. And it's easier to put into place if you have 25, 50 employees, because you have people that are could be more focused on their roles too, so that they can work on those processes. And then, and the team recognizes that they need it. Like I've, we've heard many, many teams as they're growing and scaling their companies saying, well, we got to upgrade that process. Like we've got to, this used to work really well when we could just say, Hey Matt, how are you doing this? Or where are you at on this? But now that we have 10 mats that are all doing that same job, how do we make sure we're coordinating between us? So we're not running into each other. You have to start upgrading those processes. Just did an article talking about strengths and empowerment, kind of how those align. And I think it's true for an individual person and then also an organization as a whole. So that other piece to it, and, and Matt talked about this some too, you know, someone grows in a company, you're like, oh yeah, we used to do it this way. And I used to be friends with all the people I worked with. And now I might have a leadership role over some of these people too. And that means you have to function differently, kind of at a different level. And so as an organization grows and that it automatically pulls up those people that have been there from the start too. So if people centric had a thousand people, Diana and my roles would just look totally different. So I think the pain point that comes with that too, especially if you love the thing when it started, it feels really good to remember and hold on to what you, you knew. But as that changes, I think that's one of those hard adjustments too, which goes to trust. So if the policy is there, you actually have to trust the policy and the process with the people in it. Um, Cause then those teams have to do it. Cause you don't have time to be in, in the know on all parts of what's going on anymore. Yeah. Yeah. That, you know, Don had mentioned, uh, you know, sometimes it's the employees that raise the flag. I, I, I'm kind of surprised how often it is the employees and not the leadership that raises the flag. Leadership is trying to do, no, the employees are fine. No, we're, we're, we're a well-oiled machine. We're going this way. But you start talking to the frontline employees and the employees are like, that's kind of confusing around here. Mm. Uh, it's kind of frustrating. I used to do this, but now I do this. I don't know what I'm doing anymore. Uh, and so, I don't know, just a tidbit here. If I'm leadership, make sure you're bringing the employees along for the ride as you are trying to scale or change policy or process or something. Make sure you're you're bringing them along uh, for that buy-in as well. I think that's a great observation. And I think it's because the employees are the first ones to feel it because they, they start seeing the process failures. When you have 25, 50 employees, the head of that organization still knows a lot about what's going on. I think they can still a lot of times wrap their head around. I pretty much know who we're working with. I know most of our customers. I know what's happening inside the organization. It's still a manageable size from the helm. So maybe they're looking at it saying, you know, I'm still getting, I still have a pretty good feel for a lot of the stuff, but then the employees are going on the day-to-day stuff. There's things that are dropping left and right. So it becomes increasingly important to start to listen to your employees so that you can understand where those pain points are and increasingly important to be able to solve those pain points because that's what makes people leave is if those pain points aren't addressed and they get frustrated and they decide to jump someplace else. So let's scale the organization again. Let's grow. Let's grow. We're going to we're going to skip a couple levels here. Let's say we have 250 employees, 300 employees. 
sometime in that. So now you think about that organization when you had you have 10 people, you're just thinking it's like a person and some people underneath that, right? It's like it's like one branch. You have 50 employees, maybe you have like a couple branches, right? You have a person at the top, maybe three or four managers, and then some people from there. You start getting 300 people, and now you're adding a whole nother layer to it. You've got departments now that are forming, you know, people don't know everybody, you know, 50 employees, you might know most of the people in the company, but 250, there's no way that you know everybody in the company. So what are some of the strengths and weaknesses from that? I mean, like you were saying, the the department thing means that you probably are able to do specialized work. If you are in marketing, you're able to do marketing. You can go to that company and say, I'm a marketer. I want to do marketing. Do you have an opening for me? Instead of more generalized work, it's a it's more specialized, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So people can be hyper hyper focused roles starting at about that number. Yeah. Yeah. You know, one of the, one of the, uh, one of the things, I'm sorry, Diana, I didn't mean to step on your toes there, but one of the, one of the things that uh, I might also say is, it, and maybe this is bad, but I thought of the weaknesses first before I thought of the positives. I saw, I saw a lot of the positives for the smaller, but as we're getting bigger, the weaknesses tend to be a little bit more glaring. And, and, you know, I'm thinking about the organizations that we work with that have that size. They're always frustrated because communication is difficult, which we've talked about that at every layer. Um, but they're also frustrated. One of the number one things we hear about is uh, the accountability part. Creating a consistent standard. It used to be at a smaller level. You used to be able to, I don't know, post it on the wall. Like, here's the 10 things that we operate by. And everybody, everybody knew it. As you get bigger, now you have to make sure that you are communicating that well. But I also have a strong leadership team in place that is also lockstep with uh, you know, in, in together, uh, so they're they're portraying the same message, and you can kind of look at it as a 250 or 500 person company, and you can see your organization, your executive team might be might be solid on these things, but then there's a layer that it has to filter down to, and then there's another layer that it has to filter down to, and then there's another layer that it has to filter down to, which is why typically whenever they start picking up the phone, going. We're having a hard time communicating this to people, or we have half a leadership team holding holding integrity to these standards. We have the other half of leadership team not holding integrity to these standards, uh, and it's getting a little it's getting a little wonky to use a technical term, right? It's getting a little chaotic around here, and we're not sure how to be able to manage uh, manage that. Diana, were you going to add? Yeah, you just used the word alignment, and I think that's really difficult right now. It's super easy for Don to say whatever his mission and vision is. He said it. He can tell us it and we can follow it, right? Super easy to do. But when there's 500 people, how do you make sure that everyone really understands the mission, the vision, the values? How do you make sure everyone's living that? How do you make sure that there is accountability to that? You also said a strong leadership team. And man, that's a, lo that's a loaded, that's a loaded requirement. <laughs> Like, how do you get a strong leadership team? What does that look like? Who are your leaders? Why are they your leaders? Did you train your leaders? There's like a whole new set of things that happen. They're like, yeah, wow, we, this is big. We were in a meeting earlier this week uh, working with an organization that we're about to start working with and we're trying to get wrap our minds around it. So who's on the leadership team? Well, these people on the leadership team. Okay, but then it goes to managers. No, 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 no. It goes to supervisors and directors and then, and then managers, right? Then managers, but they're four layers removed. If I'm a company, if I'm a middle manager of a 500 person company, I've probably never met Don. You know what I mean? I, I, I don't know. I'm so far removed from Don. I don't, what's Don's mission? I don't know. Uh, I'm three levels below that. I, I I don't know. I never have that. I never have that space uh, there too. And so you might you might be thinking, but part of the people listening might be going, yeah, I kind of like it like that because I can hide here. It's just fine. I'm just going. I get to dictate my own rules. Uh, but what you're also doing, if you're dictating your own rules, you're kind of hiding there. Is you're probably creating chaos for the levels above of the you know the meetings that are happening above you are going. Why are they doing what they're doing? And I think there's accountability on both sides of that problem too, which is typically where people call us. Peoplecentric.com. Feel free to look at that. <laughs> check us out. Yeah, when we work with the 250, that size of an organization, uh, what we will think a lot about is the org chart and think about first of all, is it really clear? And then you think about, do you have the right leaders in the right places in terms of how they communicate and whether they're bought in or not? Because if you think about what happens, if you think about an org chart and this tree that goes down and communication flows up and down that, it's almost like blood flow to a limb, right? One leader in one spot who doesn't communicate very well or and or is disengaged from the company for one reason or the other is going to choke off blood flow to that entire limb 
like that entire area. And we've seen it. We've done engagement surveys before where you look and say, like, look at there's engagement levels really high, except there's this pocket of disengagement and this pocket of toxicity or whatever that, that happens. And we, we often joke and say, like, if you could put stickers on people's foreheads of green, yellow or red, you know, depending whether you're engaged, disengaged or toxic, you would see the stickers traveling in packs together. You would see the greens walking together and you would see the greens working for people who have green stickers. And you would see red people working for people who have red stickers on their forehead. Um, it just has a much bigger impact when you have somebody who's in a middle management position who may not be aligned with the organization or who doesn't communicate well, because that message just gets lost. It's a telephone game, right? So you have to really work hard to make sure that you've got the right people in those positions and that they have a good communication cadence to be able to communicate things through up and down through the organization. And if they're not, Don, if they're not, that's kind of on you. You have to hold accountability to them not, you know, because we hear that quite a bit too. We hear the frustration of the leadership going, they're not doing the thing. Yeah. Well, why do they continue to not do the thing? And that that might be a role too. Maybe that's not, maybe you grew at such a pace where um, you used to be able to kind of maintain that. And now you're in a position where you have to hold people accountable to maintain that, which is a different role, you know? So maybe let's recognize your role too. Like your role changed also, but that's where you are. If they're yeah. not doing the thing, that's kind of on you too. Yeah, for a team of seven people like we have, like as a CEO, if you're the head of that, you're pretty much like a supervisor working for that group. Like you have to play lots of different roles, but you can just kind of see what's going on and it's very, very hands on. When you get to 250 people, the manager's role has to evolve. There's a difference between like a front end supervisor versus a manager versus a director versus an executive. Like those are different positions. And a lot of times managers aren't trained how to do the job in the first place. So then when they evolve into a director role, where now I see oversee a lots of different people, they still treat it like a supervisor where they think about a lot too much about workflow. And I got to know all the things that are going on and those things versus the bigger picture saying, I'm just trying to communicate vision and systems and supporting you and solving problems for the, with the group, but also empowering and trying to open up the communication, uh, those types of things. People get really lost. We call that the executive quicksand. And we've talked about that in the, in the past where you just, you get lost in all the stuff that you do on a day-to-day -day basis. A lot of 300 people companies, when we talk to their middle managers, have almost no control. And even their executives and even their CEOs have no control over their day. They're just going to work and going to meetings all day long without really just because their calendar told them to. And they've lost control over their organization. It's running them, not them running the organization. One difference between those sizes too, and Diana shared a story recently that I thought kind of applies to this. So when she was a different firm working with marketing, she shared, I was really into social media, um, but leadership at this organization wasn't as much. And every time I brought it up, you know, it was like my passion piece. And I said, well, we should do it. And the question was why? Because it's great. We can share our message. And it's before social media was cool. So it's retro to talk about this. But um, when it eventually started happening on the side, you know, Diana was doing this project and then came and showed, look, these are the research. These are the likes and leadership still said, I don't care about that. I don't, I don't know why that's valuable. And so I think in an organization that's especially larger, when you're work, almost like coaching up to leadership, because leadership's, you know, it's like a coaching cycle, I guess you could say we can always improve. But looking at these problems, whatever they are for your team or your department and leadership and the organization as a whole to help your clients, um, approaching your own leadership team almost like a client at times, because I think to assume that they know everything um, and then to take all that time to like way over process a situation, like use your internal team for that. So that whoever it is that goes and then says like, hey, here's a thing we've noticed. Let's work on this. It's a solution for you and all of us because X, Y, Z. Um, I think that's a difference too in how you communicate that can be more effective in the long run. That's great advice. That's great. So let's go to our last size organization. I know we could pick this apart. We could actually break this down even more as a team, just so you know, like the inside stuff. We we talk about this quite a bit. Like we know the difference between a 20 person team and a 40 person team and an 80 person team and a 100 person team and all those things. But let's jump to like the big company. Let's talk about like a 10,000 person organization, like a corporation kind of a thing. That, what's the what's what happens at that level? everything is regulated, right? Not just like policy and procedure, but there's like government regulations and there's like rules and stuff you have to follow on that side. There's probably associations that you're a part of and there's, you know, ethics for that and codes of conduct for that. I mean, they, everything is regulated. Yeah, you become, it's hyper-controlled almost in lots of different ways. 
Yeah. Yeah. You know, the hyper control thing, it sounds, it sounds like this is positive because there's a process and there's a standard for everything. It also is uh, stringent. And what I mean, what I mean by that is people like uh, large corporations, it's almost like the epitome of, okay, they have made the rule. The employees are also making their own rules to dance around the rules that you've created. Right. So uh, if you want your people to be super transparent and open and honest with communication, probably not getting that at a large corporation because there's words that you can say that, you know, trigger full on investigations. And, you know, I don't want it to be like that. I just want to, I just wanted a sounding board and, you know, stuff like that. Like it, you get, they learn, the employees learn to play the game that, uh, you know, that, that they are shown the rules to, I guess, by the corporation um, as well. I can't say anymore for fear of being outed. So I got to. Right. But I think there's some, be- like you were saying, I think there's some benefit to people who like that structure and like that security. I, a giant company like that might be or might feel more secure than some of these smaller companies where, you know, you just never really know where the dollars are coming from and you never know what your job looks like. And, you know, some of that, like there's a built in safety net almost. It would be, it's harder to fail in those, those big environments. In college, we did a study um, on, it's called the Hertzberg's two-factor theory of motivation, which all that basically means there's two different things that motivate people. Um, And so what we did, we kind of investigated people who are at the top of their professions, like attorneys, doctors, in these really big structured organizations, kind of to Diana's point, really well-regulated, really clear expectations and guidelines like a big monster ship. And then we also interviewed people who own their own businesses, anywhere from like 500 people down to five people. What was super interesting, the most satisfied people were those that you know owned their own business, but they worked way more hours and uh, had way more concerns about life, right? It went far beyond, but their mission just meant so much to them. On the other side, these people were highly compensated, best in their fields, but all of them rated as not interested very much in their work. And they all made comments to the effect of, you know, when I started this, had I known 30 years later what I'd be doing, I wouldn't have done it. I would have gone back and done something I'd have been passionate about and made less money. And that isn't to say that if you're a doctor or an attorney that you're not satisfied, but they loved meeting people, but the parts of those jobs they hated were like the paper and the process and all of that part. Um, So I think the challenge with a group of, you know, 10,000 and more is that you have way more employees like that. So empowerment is probably harder to connect with, with a team that big, whereas alignment it's almost not a choice. You're, you're aligned, doing the thing. With a smaller team, you're married so much more to empowerment, but alignment maybe at times you're like, hey, don't get distracted. The rabbits are there, but you know the cow is this way or the, the mission is this way. Go that direction. Yeah. So the big corporations, lots of better control over, not control over the ship. You know, you've probably heard the phrase big ship, small rudder. Yeah. They're hard to turn. Like big ships are harder to turn in the water, which is true, I think, for larger organizations, but they have a lot more processes, more resources. They have a person you can call to take out your trash, apparently, at JP Morgan. Give them a shout out for having that. Uh, but you also can become more disconnected from the mission out there, and there's more potential for that to happen in different pockets. So you might see larger pockets of disengagement or even toxicity because there's pushback on it. One of the things I know that I've seen from big organizations, and I used to do this myself for organizations I've worked for, is that a lot of times we personify large organizations still. So we will think like when I was at 3M, we used to say, well, 3M thinks this, or 3M wants us to do this, or 3M thinks. The truth is about an organization that size, as we've studied that a lot, is once you get past about 500 employees, 500-ish employees, maybe a little bit more than that, you start to add such a level, you start to transform from being an organization to being more almost an ecosystem. And the ecosystem, it's almost like, think more like a government or something like that as a body. It's not necessarily, and when I say that, some people are like, so you're saying it's evil or bad or not inefficient or all those things. No, it's just a different type of an organization. So you see, like some of the things you talked about before, Matt, were like, really what you're talking about, the politics. Like the politics are dialed up. Like you can upset people a little easier inside of a big organization because there's so much distance. It's like, oh, why did that person in that department do this? There's more kingdom building inside of larger organizations. So there's, and if you go inside, when we work with big organizations, we can still work with large organizations and work very effectively, but we don't start usually at the very top and say, let's transform all of 3M in this culture. 
we start more at the bottom and work our way up. Like, let's start with this one facility or let's start with this one area or this one division or this one department, because that's a more manageable team. That part is an organization versus being like, they're more of like a confederation of organizations. So let's build those organizations and that structure between. Um, I know one organization that is pretty good size, over a billion dollar organization has thousands of employees, but they organize their whole company based on business units that operate pretty autonomously from each other. And their general rule is once they start pushing over like 250, 300 employees, they start to think maybe we should divide that up. Maybe we should break that up because of that idea of saying, I want the, I still want somebody to be, I still want it to be manageable. I want it to be at a sweet spot. Um, Last bit piece I wanted to add to that, Diane, is you talked about the security for those large organizations. And I remember jumping out from my corporate, the warm corporate blanket of the of the large company with the nice, comfortable profit sharings and 401ks and all the things that the big companies do. But, you know, those companies lay people off, too. Uh, I think it was Jim Carrey did a presentation I saw at a, at a commencement where he said, if you realize you can lose the job, the safe job that you never really liked, it makes you a lot more likely to go take that risk and go after the job that you really do love. And I think there's a little bit of that perception out there that the job is safe. But I mean, a lot of the people who said I was crazy for making my jump have been laid off since they've had their job. And my job ended up being actually safer than what their job was. And I'm not saying I, that's not an I told you so or that's the direction, just saying there's not safety in any job. All of you could be laid off tomorrow, any of you. So just... Well, and I do think that people also believe that those big organizations have more room for growth, right? The like, I can get a better title or whatever, which is true, you can, but it's a growth in title. It's probably not necessarily a growth in, in skills and, and, and leadership traits. And like, it, it's just not as intensive. Whereas with people centric, I've had, I've just had to learn a lot, right? So maybe I haven't grown in title over and over and over, but I have grown in skills over and over and over. And to me, the skills are more important. Yeah. And maybe it's what the skills are too, right? Because it's very specific. Like at 3M, I got a chance to work with like some of the top adhesive scientists, like people who have just studied adhesives, a very specific skill set that you can learn. So like if your goal in life is to learn how adhesives work and stick or don't stick, and that's what you want to get to become world-class at that, you know, going to a large organization is where you want to go. Our team's kind of laughing at that, but I mean, that's real. I mean, there's people who, if you want to be the very, very best software developer, you know, that you can ever be in, maybe Google is a great place to go. They're world-class at that. You know, it's a big organization. That's great. And I've got friends that work there and they talk about that, how they, the, that level, if you want to get your art up to the top level, uh, that's probably a good place for it to go. But if you want to learn lots of different things, maybe the broader experiences and more a little bit about the leadership and things like that, maybe smaller organizations are a little bit better. So I think the takeaway from all of this is that there's not one right size. We're not saying, okay, the right number of employees is to have 37. That's what you're shooting for is to have 37 employees. <laughs> but the right thing is maybe two things is one is to let's design the machine to work the way it's supposed to work. So if you have a seven person company, you need to design it to work like a seven person company. If you have 700 employees, you need to design that as well, which means more communication, more processes, those types of things. You have to implement systems to support the overall organization. And then if you're thinking of jumping, to another organization, then be careful how you jump because you may you be realistic about what that is. Uh, I've seen people jump small to big and love it. I've seen people jump from big to small and love it. And I've seen both of those situations and they hate it. It should be more really about the day-to-day -day people that you work with and also your expectations uh, when you make those leaps. So closing thoughts here from our team. I was just thinking, you know, one of the reasons I left Liberty Mutual um, was because one of the leaders, he was not like, in the top executive level, but basically just one one rung below, director of an entire several state area. He came to our office, you know, talking, and I was at an intern at that time doing some graduate work at Missouri State, so a blended thing. Um, he sat down with me, talked for an hour, literally, because a lot of agents were just busy selling. They're like, we're trying to sell. We don't need inspiration. I love inspiration. And so at the end of this conversation, he said, you know, wherever you wherever you go in life, Always find an organization where your own mission and vision and values can align with that organization. And I'd never heard that before. And he was probably the most lively leader I had experienced my whole time at Liberty. And there were a lot of great people there. Um, but that one piece of advice I just have taken forever. And I think he does really well in his role, even in this massive organization, because it really is, he essentially expressed, 
alignment and empowerment, both as a leader and then encouraging someone wherever you go, build and find those two things. I agree totally. I think some of the best advice I ever got was, Diana, you're going to be successful wherever you go and you could do this job at any company. So pick a company that you like the people, that you like the mission and that you're aligned with. Yeah. That's good. I think one of the things that we uh, did not talk about, and I guess I'm going to, <laughs> I'm not as inspiring as uh, what Philip and Diana were here, I guess. I, I'm going back to a business -y thing. One of the things that we did not uh, touch on as you scale, strategic planning comes even more and more impactful as a small business. It's like, I just roll out the goals. Uh, you know, we all have a meeting. It's great. As you get larger, strategic planning is, has got to be one of those things that you're setting aside time to do and then having a plan to be able to filter that to the people that you're trusting to help you accomplish the plan. Um, that becomes more and more prevalent, it seems, as you know, as you scale, the, the larger you get, being able to one, accomplish the or uh, set the plan, but then filter the plan to the people and then work on executing the plan. So anyway, I would I would just encourage you to think about that part of it too as you're scaling. You can't just have the thoughts in your mind anymore. You really got to get in, get in with the team and, and flesh it out and then have a good plan of how to filter and execute the plan too. So another way of saying that is that small companies can get away with strategic planning, but larger ones have to do strategic systems. How do we implement this over a long period of time? Not just as a one time, hey, let's get together and set some goals, but as an ongoing system for setting goals, tracking KPIs, communicating up and down the organization, making adjustments, all of those different things. So, well, this is a fun one for us. I know we love to talk about scale organizations. We'd like to geek out on that topic. And hopefully it was useful for you, whether you're thinking about jumping jobs or thinking about growing your companies. Listen, whatever it is that you do, it may not be the size of the company that really leads to your, your success. It's how people-centric the company is at the end of the day. So you can grow your company and keep it people-centric. You just have to be deliberate about making sure you're creating a place where people are empowered and aligned. And I think that's where we'll leave it. If you've got more topics, please send them our way. Thanks for joining us on this episode. Thank you for listening to the People Centered Podcast. We are so grateful for you joining us every week. If you like this content, please like and subscribe. Also feel free to share on your social media with everyone that you know. It really does help us. If you would like to contact us, I have put our information in the show notes. Please reach out anytime. We love hearing from you. We will be back next week with a new topic. Until then, be well and lead well.